those who are watching online, I'd like to welcome you to our morning service, our morning gathering. Um, from the audience uh, in our auditorium, we want to say a really great to have you with us. And uh, if you live near Emsworth, in our area, we'd love to invite you to come in and attend one of our um, in-person services, especially over the Christmas season. So welcome, welcome everyone. As I begin to uh, my, my talk this morning, I'd like to ask a favour from you. I'd like to ask you to join me in doing some <clears throat> additions and subtractions. Okay, not very difficult ones, okay? Promise you that. So imagine that you've got some money in your pocket. I know that these days we don't have much of that, but imagine that you've got some money in your pocket. Um, anything between one and, say, ten pounds. One and ten pounds. And, and just keep it kind of simple. Let's keep it to a rounded figure of a pound uh, without any pens in, in front of it, so it makes life easier. So think of that one number, okay, that you've got in your pocket. Have you got it? Great. Now add another six to that number. Okay, got your number. Now add another six. Now subtract three. Okay, working through it. So your number, add six, subtract three. Now subtract your original number. Okay, so you're going through that. Subtract your original number. And the last one, now add one. One pound. Okay. And now in a superb example of me bending your minds to my will, I can tell you that if you've done the additions and subtractions correctly, the final figure that each one of you has in his or her mind is, it's up on the screen, four. How's that? <laughs> Talk about me bending your mind to my will, okay. Actually, it's a very simple maths illustration that I've just used, okay. Um, <clears throat> and from this very simple exercise, um, the leaflet that you found on your chair as you came into the building, um, the details that I gave you about our gift day, uh, it will not come to you as a surprise that this morning we'll be talking about uh, money. Uh, more precisely, considering God's financial favour. Now, you know that it's not one of the topics I address very often. In fact, I think this is the first time that I'm talking about it this year. But as we begin to consider our gift day, I felt led to be able to share it. Because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are meant to experience financial favor. You are meant to experience God's direct involvement in your financial life. Now, I realize that what I've just done may in fact raise a somewhat uncomfortable feeling in you. And I don't blame you for it. Uh, there are many reasons why this is so. Um, to start with, money is kind of a private thing, so we don't really want to talk about it. We certainly don't want to talk about it in church. And it could well be that you may well have heard, maybe on TV, uh, some religious guy talking about money. Or maybe you've heard a message in a church, or you've read a book, and it just, just felt wrong. Something along the lines that if, uh, if you do the right things, if you say the right words, if you get the right person to pray for you, then God is obliged to aid you or to assist you financially and to do so big time. But for God to bless you big time, then you have to plant a seed. And the more you give to God, well, the bigger the return that you can expect. And if God doesn't bless you financially, well, that's because there is sin in your life or um, you just don't have enough faith or you're struggling with because um, you're just not saying the right words. And we all struggle with this because it just feels so wrong. 
And then we compare it to the lifestyle that we see of some preachers, and you begin to say, this is not really right. Just about a month ago um, in New York, a preacher, speaker was robbed during one of the morning gatherings, kind of made the news big time. And so the three armed guys came and took some of the, while well, he's watching a few other things that he had with him. Do you know how much? One million dollars that he was carrying on himself in jewelry. That is just so wrong, okay? And so we kind of see these things and, and what do we do? We kind of back off of anything that talks about God's financial favor. We shut down and we close the door of any possibility that we could experience God's financial blessing upon us. So we tend to go from one extreme to the other. This morning, though, I like to spend some time not looking at what some churches may say, not looking at what some preachers may say, not looking at what some books may say, but instead at what God says as he speaks through the Bible. So if you game, let's look at one of the, those foundational Bible passages um, and then let's unpack it and see what principles are there that we can apply to our lives. These are the words of the prophet Malachi. Uh, he records a kind of a dialogue between God and the people of Israel. They had drifted away from God. And these are the words that we want to look at this morning. So let's look at the passage. Malachi 3 from verse 7. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Now, that's quite a passage. <laughs> and uh, if some of the language is a little bit on the confusing side, let me give you, give you five key words. They are tithe, offering, store hours, curse, and blessing. And we're going to look at four of those in a bit more detail. So let's begin with the first one, the tithe. Now, the word literally means 10%. And it was a term that was used for the practice of taking 10% of everything that people earned they got and giving it to God. So when you talk about the tithe, we're not just talking about money. Um, there is a deep theological and biblical idea behind these verses. If there is a God, then everything that we have has been given to Him, but to, to us by Him. Our health, our intelligence, our abilities... They all come from God. Everything that we have is a direct result of God's enablement in our lives. It's God, it's like God saying, I have given you 100% um, of all that you've got, share 10% with me. And, and you, you may remember from the verse that uh, I used from Deuteronomy just a couple of Sundays ago, um, this is how the Bible speaks about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17, we read this. You may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So if we pat ourselves on the back for all our financial accomplishments, let's remember that the very next breath that we have is a gift of God. Everything we have is of God's. Without Him, there is not much that we can do. 
So, as I said, our intellect, our abilities, our natural skills, these are all a God thing given to us. Whatever it is that enables us to have what we have was given to us by God. Who then simply says, return 10% to me. So that's the concept of the tithe. Let's move on. Offering is the next word. Now, offering was something slightly different. It was given above and beyond the tithe. Um, periodically, uh, out of gratitude and out of the commitment to God, people were given an offering over and above their normal giving. Uh, very much like we do every year with our um, annual gift day offering. And if you study the history of Israel in the Old Testament, you see a lot of examples of this, of such offerings throughout the uh, the, the Old Testament, often associated with national festivals. So the Passover, there'll be a certain an offering. Um, the unleavened bread, the first fruits, which was really a challenging time to give an offering for an agrarian society which depended so much on harvest every year, to give of the first fruits, the first bit that they had, was really a massive step of trust because there was no guarantee that there'll be a harvest. And so, for the Israelites, these offerings were above and beyond their normal giving. It was an expression of their gratitude for all that God had done for them as a people, as a nation, for his protection and for his care. And out of that, and without developing too much, you also see the word store ours, bring your tithes and your gifts to the store ours. And if we're going to take into our New Testament concept, we're really talking about the kingdom of God. But the next word that I really want to focus on is the word curse. Verse 9, you are under a curse. And that's God speaking to the people of Israel. Now, that is a strong word. So let's make sure that we understand what it actually really means. To be under a curse, certainly within the biblical context, it's not being like being under some kind of spell uh, or enchantment like you would and, uh, find as you read about a fairy uh, tale or one of the Harry Potter books. It's not that kind of language that we're using here. In the Bible, to be uh, under a curse of God meant to be outside of his blessing, outside of his umbrella of protection and provision. It meant that you were operating independently of his supernatural oversight and intervention. You were isolated from God's care. And then as we read the passage, there is one more word, which is blessing, which is the next word that I want to look at very briefly. Now, there are two extremes um, that people can take as they look at what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches about being blessed. The first extreme is to fall into the health and welfare approach. Uh, and that, well, the wealth affair that says, um, if you tithe, um, God is obliged to give you the very best. So tithe and you too can drive a Ferrari because God will get you one. Or give your tithe and you'll get this amazing house in the best part of town with a swimming pool and everything else that you want. And God is obliged to do that for you. In the most pastoral and caring sense I can exercise, if you ever hear that kind of talk in a church, or on TV, in a book, anywhere, the one thing I can do is to advise you, turn your back and get away. Because whoever and whatever is saying that is wrong. It is not biblical, it is not sound doctrine, it's not good theology, it is wrong. But, and it's a big but, there is another extreme which is just as wrong. And it's the idea that there is no blessing, there's no favor of God attached to the way that we support him financially. Because, as we've just read in the passage, there certainly is. There's a relationship between what we do financially and what God does. The Bible teaches without qualification that if we follow God's plan into this financial management, if we return to him what he has asked us to give to him, he will bless us. The question, though, is what kind of blessing are we talking about? Well, it's really up to God. 
It's never really spelled out in the Bible. It certainly could be financial. But it could also be the blessing of an <clears throat> ongoing financial security, <clears throat> pardon me, or personal joy, or deep sense of fulfillment. They can be a blessing from God on our relationships, our marriages, our children, our families. It can be favor shown in, on an enterprise, a new venture, a breakthrough as we pray. When we think of a blessing from God, the only limit is God's creativity, which just happens to have no limits. Listen to what God says. Of the passage that we've been reading, verses 10 and 11. Test me in this. That's what God is saying. Test me in this, is the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be enough room for you to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe says the Lord Almighty. Crops in the fields and fruit on the vine was income. It was their security. For those listening to the words of the prophet Malachi, God was really talking about day, day, day to day, their, their lives, their livelihood, and it was their money supply. And if the pests devoured the crops, there was no crop to sell or to trade. And if the fruit fell off the vine before it was ready, well, it couldn't be harvested, it could not be sold. It was a blow to their income, to their security, to their day-to-day -day living. So what is God saying in this passage? He's saying, you be faithful to me financially. I will be faithful to you in my blessings. God is making sure that if those who follow him in this area do not worry that their giving will take away from their supply. They can rest assured that they will not lose because of their obedience to God. That if they give their 10%, God will make sure that the 90% will go just as far, if not further. He will supernaturally care for their needs. This is if God is saying, listen, trust me enough and care about me enough to do what I ask. And in return, I will become supernaturally involved in your life bringing you the blessings that you need. Take care of your money in your normal ways. Don't make unwise and stupid decisions. Don't go crazy with debt. Do your part, and I'll do mine. So that's the teaching that we find in Malachi as we consider our financial giving. Now, I know that either online or maybe even sitting here, you may well be thinking, that's just not part of what I want to hear. Uh, it makes me feel anything but good about my spiritual walk with God and uh, just not what I really wanted to hear. You see, for some people I realize the situation is such that margin between income and an expenditure is so thin, is so tight, that with the best will in this world, there is no way that anyone could simply give in a situation like that. End of story. And so you kind of end up thinking, not only am I missing God's blessings, according to the passage, I find myself under a curse. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Let me say this as loudly and as clear as I can. Above all, God is for you, not against you. He loves you. He's not trying to impose some legalistic sets of do's and don'ts that are impossible to follow. So that as soon as you and I make that mistake, uh, it can abandon us and, and just let us get on with our lives. He or she is not giving me my 10% of income. Well, I'm no longer responsible for them. Um, that's okay. Whatever happens to them, not my fault, not my problem, out of it. Okay. Let's be a bit more practical. Let, let me be practical as I share this with you. 
And if you find yourself in that position where you say, there's no way I could ever give anything to the kingdom of God. I could never give a tithe. Start where you are. Start where you can. It's not, it has to be everything. This is really a biblical idea. Over and over, we see God calling his people to do something, and it's often a massive task. And his first, first word is usually not accomplish this, but rather begin this. It's not do this now, but rather start this now. For example, when God led the Israelites out of the, into the promised land, he told them that they were to take the possession of it all, and it was a lot of land to possess, and it would take years. But the language that we find that God uses when he says this to them, we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 2, it says, begin to take the possession. He's not saying, take the land now. He didn't expect everything to be accomplished immediately as much as to say, I want you to start and I'll go with you step by step as you follow my desires for you. And it's the same with our finances. It is as if God is saying, start moving towards what you think you should do. And yes, it may take time, but begin and God will be the light of that because he knows the state of your heart. But as I say this, I realize that, and that's one of the things that I always struggle when I have to preach about money. <laughs> because we're not really talking about money. We're not talking about finance at all. What we're talking about is faith and trust. And maybe for some of us, this is the biggest test of faith and trust that can ever come our way. Faith in doing something which is totally illogical, giving away what we have, believing that it will be enough, that God will provide, that God will care for us. As I said, it is a massive step in trust and faith to put ourselves in that position trusting that God will keep his side of the promise. Which is why financial giving really is intentional, never spare of the moment. Now, let me bring my message, my talk to an end. And I'll do so by using uh, an illustration I read a little while ago. Uh, it's written by one of my favorite Christian writers who happens to be a pastor as well. And he tells the following story. Um, he preached a sermon on uh, financial giving. And at the end of the gathering, uh, somebody was relatively new to the church, um, asked to speak to him. And he said, look, I'm relatively new in the faith. Um, I've come to faith in your church. I've been baptized in the faith. I'm trying to grow um, spiritually. But giving financially, it is a massive problem and a struggle for me. Okay. And, and this man then went to say, although I have a good salary, um, he was up to his eyeballs in debt, student loans, over mortgage, and so on. His financial life was a mess. He was literally living from payday to payday, and there was no way that he could give anything away. And it doesn't make any sense at all, but I'm going to start with a very, very small amount, and then a test to go on. And Pastor said, yeah, that's good, we can, I'll pray for you. And that was it. Okay. Now, as a church, we also give our tithe. You may not be aware that at least 10% of our income, we give out to missions and to the kingdom of God. That's because we believe in the words of God. That's our corporate giving to God as a church. Oh, by the way, um, what happened to the guy I just told you about? Two, year late, two years later, after morning service, he went to the pastor and said, I'm there. And the pastor had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. You are there? Well, that's great. Glad to hear it. Thinking inwardly, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he said, do you remember about two years ago when you spoke to me? Today, for the first time I did it, I was able to give my full tithe. It took me two years, but I have never gone without, and God has always supplied my needs. 
This has been the most incredible journey of showing me that God can be trusted. If you want to take a few words with you this morning that summarize the passage that we've been just studying, here they are. Financial favor from God. It's not about money. It's about trust. It's whether we really believe that God will do that which is illogical to us. So using the phrase that has been our theme in some ways over these last few weeks, financial favor from God. Are you ready to step out of the boat and walk on water with your finances? Let's pray. And Father, this is a difficult topic for all of us because it's something we don't like to talk about. Um, finance gives us security, Lord. But it help us to, to be the, the type of people, the church that believes and trusts you. You, the God who promised to care for each one of us, Lord. May that be our experience as we trust you with our finance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.